Hello and welcome back everybody. In this video we will continue our discussion of pseudo-random number generators. Let's start by considering how could we measure the quality of a pseudo-random number generator. I want to go through a number of criteria, each of which measures some aspect of quality. So the first one is what I would call period length. And that is a slightly odd thing one first needs to get used to, namely, while real random numbers never repeat, they form some random pattern, but they will never go round and round and follow the same pattern over again, it turns out that pseudo-random number generators necessarily start repeating after a while. And the reason for that is that they all follow this scheme. All of them have some internal state which evolves every time you ask for a new random number. The state is a function of the previous state. What it means is in the state space, let me make a sketch. So let's draw a little circles for the possible states. And let's say we are currently at the top state. And then if we need a new random number, we apply the function f to go to a new state. And we apply the function f again for the next random number and again. And at some point, let's say here, we reach a stage we've already had. Let's say it goes like this. After this point, now we are here again, then the next step, we apply the same function f as before, automatically brings us here, same as it did the first time round, and then we go here, same as we did the first time round, and then we make this jump up again. So in this case, there is a bit of irregularity at the start. The first step is this, so it doesn't repeat, but then we go here, 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 over and over again. So from then on, the state will be in a loop which repeats itself. And then since the output is g of s, this state will always give the same output. Next state, every time we reach this state, we will get the same output. So the output will also repeat in a period of three in this case. Since computers have finite memory, we cannot have a state space which is infinite. The states must fit in memory, so there can only be finitely many states. And for this reason, it will always happen that eventually we come back to a state we have already had. It's only finitely many, so we cannot do infinitely many steps and always go to new states. And you see, the best thing which can happen is if, say, we go like that, then we have a maximal cycle, so that's the best possible thing we can do. The longest period we can have is the length of the size of the state space. Maximum period length is the size of the state space. So for the LCG, linear congruency generator, we had the state space was the numbers from 0 up to m minus 1. So maximum period length is size of the state space from 0 to m minus 1. There are m numbers in total. So the LCG has maximum period length m. Now, that is a bit odd. Random numbers never repeat, whereas I have just argued numbers from a pseudo-random number generator always repeat. So that looks like a flaw which is difficult to work around, but in practice that is not a problem because the size of the state space can be extremely large. And what one does is one just chooses a pseudo-random number generator which has a period length which is longer than the amount of random numbers you need. So sometimes you need a million or a billion random numbers, but it's easy, it turns out, to find a random number generator which has period lengths of much more than a billion. So this problem can be avoided by choosing the period length so large that you never actually see the repetition. Then it repeats in theory, but you never see it because it would take too long. So the solution is here, choose the period length large. Good pseudo-random number generators have large period. And what we learned from this is for the LCG, we should choose M large. And there is also the Mersenne twister, which I told you, which is the pseudo-random number generator R uses if you don't tell it to do anything special. And that has a ridiculously large period length. I believe it was 2 to the power of 19,937 minus 1, which is an incredibly large number and your computer program will never be able to process this many random numbers, so for the Mersenne twister, we will always be good. The next criterion we should look at is the distribution of samples, and we haven't spoken about this yet. I wrote in the definition at the start, a pseudo-random number generator is an algorithm which outputs a sequence of numbers which can be used as a replacement for an IID sequence of random numbers. So IID, the first I means independent, we need to talk about this, and the second one means identically distributed, which means each of the random numbers 
has the same distribution, but I did not specify here what this distribution is. And in theory there is a choice, but for reasons which will become clear later, what we want to do here is we are aiming for the uniform distribution. Generate uniformly distributed samples. Now the question is, do the samples we get, say from the LCG or from the mesent tester, do they look like uniformly distributed samples? And first, we still need to be a bit more specific. So the LCG, for example, the values we get, so xn, we said, is in the state space 0, 1, up to m minus 1. So we could ask, do these numbers look like a uniform distribution on this set? That is one question, and we have kind of answered this already, namely when I did the R experiment, I showed you a histogram of the output of one specific linear concurrential generator, and the histogram looked entirely flat, that is what we expect for the uniform distribution. So we saw one instance where this looks good. But what we really want will be the continuous uniform distribution on the interval 0, 1, and the way we will approximate this is for large M, we use something I want to here just call un, which I want to define by just rescaling xn. And what specifically I want to do is I want to add 1, so I take xn plus 1, which then is in the range from 1 up to m, and I want to divide this by m plus 1, and then I get a number which is in the open interval from 0 to 1. If m is large, these values lie on a pretty dense grid in this interval. So the question is, can we get something which looks a bit like a uniform distribution on this interval? And the answer is yes, you can. And there are two reasons to believe this. The first one is the histograms we looked at. You could look at more histograms and all goes well. And if we are uniformly distributed on this discrete set, then one would think if we scale that to the interval 0 to 1, if m is large, that the gaps between the numbers become negligible, we should be close to uniformly distributed on the interval 0 to 1. So looking at histograms would be one way to convince yourself. The other way would be looking at this picture with the circle, namely if the random number generator really does it like I sketched here, if it has maximal period length, so the period length equals the size of the state space, then we take every state exactly once in a cycle, and that means every number occurs equally often, namely once, and if the states have equal density in the interval 0, 1, that's the case here, these are evenly spaced, then if I hit every number equally often, then one can even prove that the frequency of samples which hits a given interval is proportional to the length of the interval, which is close to the definition of the uniform distribution. So that is another way we can do that. And the way which I would argue which really counts is one can do statistical tests. And there are statistical tests which test for distribution. So if you have a bunch of numbers, there are statistical tests which tell you could this bunch of numbers have come from a distribution of your choice? And if we use these tests for a uniform distribution, then we get a yes or no answer, and it turns out pseudo-random number generators pass these tests without any problems. So better criterion is pseudo-random number generator output passes statistical tests for uniform distribution of samples with no problems. I will not expand on this here because that is a bit of a side topic for this module, but there is a bit more information about this in example 1.6 in the book. Example 1.6. So you should go and look there. There you get a bit more information about what I just said. And again, it's a bit of a side topic, so the important thing is the knowledge one can check if one is really determined to by applying statistical tests which determine is could a sample have come from a uniform distribution and the pseudo random number generators used in practice pass these tests. Good. Now when we looked at this definition I said we still need to talk about this I here, the independence of samples. Independence of samples. We said the output will be used as a replacement for an IID sequence. So do these samples look like they are independent? And again, there are different ways of testing this. One is we could do a pair scatter plot. So we could do a plot where we do xn here, so that's in the interval 0 to 1, and xn plus 1 here, that's in 0 to 1. And if the samples are independent, then what xn does should not affect what xn plus 1 does. So if they are independent, we should get a square which is filled with a random cloud of points, but there should be no obvious patterns visible in this cloud. 
independence is graphically quite easy to visualize if you do a plot like this. So that's one thing we can do, and I'll do that in a second for you in R. So let's use our function RLCG to produce these scatter plots. First, I want to use the parameters for the LCG we have seen here. So we produce, say, 1000 parameters from this LG LCG and store them in X. And then I can plot X0, X1 up to 999 against X2 up to 1000 and get the corresponding pair scatter plot. And you see, because M is so small, M is only 8, the period length is 8, and there are only 8 possible points in this plot. For example, we see 0 is always followed by 1, 1 is always followed by 6, 2 always followed by 3, and so on. So that looks not so good, and that looks not like what I would expect from a uniform distribution. In contrast, if we use more realistic parameters, say the ones we looked up on Wikipedia earlier, like this, then if we do the same plot again, then we see that could be a sample from a uniform distribution, namely there is a square field and there is no clear pattern. To improve the plot, I want to do two things. First, I want to rescale x, so that is in the interval 0 to 1. So what we can do is we can consider x plus 1 divided by m plus 1. Now the range of u is from 0 till nearly 1. And the other change I want to make is I want to fix the aspect ratio in the plot to 1, which makes the scale on both axes the same. And finally, I will also reduce the size of the plot margins. So here we have a nice plot. These points form a random cloud which uniformly fills the square. There are small random fluctuations, but there is no clear pattern like lines or something to see. So that is good. Finally, as a last test, I want to use the output from the Mersenne twister, which is built into R. So I do just R unif 1000. Here we don't need to rescale. R unif already gives standard uniform. And you see this plot looks very much like what the beta LCG gave. It is a random pattern which fills the square with no clearly discernible regularities. I want to discuss two other aspects, namely one is the samples are not actually independent. You see, if you look at this plot, what's happening, it says that is your current state. This completely determines the next state. So definitely the states are not independent. Here's this plot. Every state completely determines the next state by the function f, and then the outputs are determined by the functions g. So the states are definitely not independent. There is a bit of wiggle room because we still have this function g, and if this g loses some information, so if that does some equivalent of rounding the numbers a bit or cutting off some digits, then x1 does not completely determine x2 because x1 has less information than s1 and you need the full s1 to compute s2. But x1, if g loses information, does not contain this full information. So for a given x1, there could be different values of x2 following. And that indeed solves the problem. But that can only be done if you choose a function g properly. So that's a deficiency of the LCG. Without the function g, for the LCG, every number determines the next number. And better random number generators like the Mersenne twister, they have this function g built in to allow at least theoretically for the outputs to be possible. But that being said, the LCG is not so bad. When we do our scatter plots, you will see even if there is a pattern, it is not easy to spot and in practice it will also be good enough. We have now two things. One is theoretically they are not independent, unless we use the function g cleverly, then maybe. The second is we will look at scatter plots and we we'll see they actually look quite good. And the third one I want to only very quickly mention here, there is a theoretical criterion which is called the property of being k dimension equidistributed. And a sequence of numbers is k dimensionally equidistributed if every k tuple of possible outputs occurs equally often in the sequence. So for example, for the LCG, we can look how often does the pair 1, 1 appear as xn and x pl n plus 1 in the output in a long stretch of sequence. And we can ask how often does 1, 2 appear in the output and how often does 1, 3 appear in the output. And a sequence is two-dimensionally equidistributed if the frequency of all possible pairs 
converges to the same number as the same length of sequence goes to infinity and it's k-dimensionally equidistributed if that is not the case for pairs but also for subsequences of length k. And if each possible subsequence in the long run occurs with equal frequency then the output is k-dimensionally equidistributed and that is what one would expect for sequences of independent random numbers. Good pseudo-random number generators have this property for large k. And for example, the Mersenne twister has this property for some k, which I've now forgot, and where the actual value is not so important, but which is much larger than 2. Okay, and there is a tiny bit of information about this in the book at the bottom of page 7. But again, the actual technique is not so important for this module. The important thing is independence can be addressed, and good pseudo-random number generator, somebody thought about this and has made preparations that we can use the output as a sequence of independent samples. And the random number generator built into R certainly has this property, so we are good on that front too. Good. And there is one final thing I want to discuss, which is not a measure of quality, but instead is the role of the seed. And the seed we haven't discussed for a while, but that is where we start the sequence of states. So the seed is the initial state. And if you look at this diagram, you see the seed completely determines the output. If we know S0, then we can compute by applying F all other states, and we can compute all outputs for the LCG. During so this pseudo-random number generator, we haven't discussed periodicity yet, but we worked out if we start with 0, we go to 1, we go to 6, we go to 7. And from the R output we had earlier, we can see the next numbers are 4 and 5 and 2. And after 3, it turns out we go back to 0. So that's what we discussed earlier. All random number generators in a computer have a finite period length, and the period length here we can just count equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And we said for the LCG the maximal possible period length is equal to the modulus, and in this example the modulus was 8. So that is the maximum possible period length for modulus 8. And now the seed just says where do we start in the circle. So every time we say the seed is 0, we always get 0, 1, 6, 7, 4, 5, 2, 3. If we would say the seed is 4, then we would get the sequence 4, 5, 2, 3, 0, 1, and so on. And eventually it will hit itself. But we assume the period length is so large that we do not actually see the repetition. So what really happens is the seed just determines which of the possible output sequences of the pseudo-random number generator we get. There is a choice. First, we can fix the seed. That can be done using the function dot seed in R, you get to plug in your seed here. And for a fixed seed we always get the same output. So this is actually useful in practice. So advantages reproducible output. And that can be useful, for example, in a report, if it's important that somebody else can redo your work, like if you do some official work and somebody else will be paid for checking your work. Also, if you say I use seed 7, then this other person can go ahead and redo your work and get exactly the same output. So that it is an advantage. And another application is for debugging your program. If you write a program which uses random numbers and it mysteriously crashes and next time around you run it, it does something different because the random numbers come out differently, then it's very hard to find mistakes. But if you can set the seed so that the program does the same thing every time, then often it's much easier to narrow down to where the mistake is. So for reports or it's called debugging the process of finding a mistake in a program. So that has its uses. And if you want something which really looks more like a random number, so if we run our program twice, it gives different outputs that could be used, like for a game where you don't want the same thing to happen every time you run the game or so, or just to make it look more random. What people do is they use some quantity like the current time of day as a sheet. So for non-reproducible output, use current time of day and so on as you see. And that's the standard technique that solves the problem in the sense now if you run your program twice, then the second start it is a different time and your random number generator gives different outputs, so it looks more like a random sequence. That is what R does. It uses some transient quantity which changes over time and plugs this into the seed. So if you don't use z.seed and then generate random numbers, you get different random numbers every time you start up R. Good, 
And that is really all I want to say here about pseudo-random number generators. This concludes our discussion of section 1.1 of the book. And what you should do now is you should go and actually read the section and you will find there are a few more details than I've mentioned in these videos, but I have hopefully discussed all of the main points, so reading this section should be now easy enough. Once we have read this section, in the following sections we will discuss how we can convert the output of a pseudo-random number generator, which we assume to be uniformly distributed, to obtain samples from different distributions like the normal distribution or the exponential distribution. But for now, goodbye everybody.